over a span of 2,000 years, 40 authors on three different continents and in three different languages penned 66 books, all of which were supernaturally inspired and intricately designed as God's revelation to man. The spoken word of God, living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword, recorded and bound just for us. Join us on a journey from Genesis to Revelation, all 66 books. The big book, cover to cover. This is Michael Easley in Context. Daniel in broad sweeps is one of the more controversial and complicated books in the Old Testament. It is sometimes called the revelation of the Old Testament, um, depending on, and not get, to get too far down these, these trails, but covenant theology, reform theology, dispensational theology, all these different iterations of how we do theology and approaching the Bible. Um, there are very different takes on this book. Um, this book is what is called apocryphal literature. We'll talk about that in a moment. But in broad sweeps, we have a teenager who goes into captivity in Babylon, and he's going to spend most of his life there, essentially. So he'll be probably 15 to 16 when he goes, and in his 80s uh, when it's said and done. So the first part of the book covers this prominence of Daniel. He goes from nothing to prominent to you know threatened in the, in the lion's den and so forth. The second part of the book is rich in imagery and visions and really weird stuff for some people. And so most uh, pastors who teach the book of Daniel will not teach the second portion. And that we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, as I do almost every week, I refer to Boa and Wilkinson's book, Talk Through the Bible, in part, I'm going to read the section, but just part of this on the screen, Daniel, sometimes referred to as the apocalypse of the Old Testament, presents a majestic sweep of prophetic history. The Babylonians, Persians, Greeks, and Romans will come and go, but God will establish his people forever. Nowhere is this theme more apparent than in the life of Daniel, a young, God-fearing Jew, transplanted from his homeland and raised in Babylonia. His adventures and those of his friends in the palace, the fiery furnace, and the lion's den show that even during the exile, God has not forgotten his chosen nation. And through Daniel, God provides dreams and interpretations of dreams designed to convince Jew and Gentile alike that wisdom and power belong to him alone. Uh, let's start out with some broad stroke observations about the book of Daniel. Uh, the Babylonians rule most of the ancient Near East, which includes Israel, and uh, these captive, captives have been taken away. Nebuchadnezzar is on the throne in Babylon. He's the reigning king over the ancient Near East. And um, again, I remind you, if an EMP went off in New York and Chicago and Dallas-Fort Worth and L.A., uh, wherever major city centers in the U.S., and we were all so, sudden lost technology, uh, communication infrastructure. Um, it, it would set us back. We wouldn't know what to do. Uh, well, these guys have been taken from their homeland and taken to another nation. And what we're reading about, they're not going to experience the end game in their lifetimes. So it's important to keep that in mind when we read some of these books. Um, Nebuchadnezzar is a fascinating case study of a Babylonian ruler because he goes from being this arrogant, uh, hubris king uh, to being uh, what I think is a believer in Yahweh Elohim. Uh, the height of his hubris in Daniel 5, when he takes the vessels that were taken from the temple complex, and he uses them and gives them to his guests, his, his wives, his concubines, his noblemen, and they drink out of it. It's an insult to the God of Israel. We've taken our war trophies and we've taken them back to Babylon and we're going to drink wine out of them and celebrate that we conquered uh, these Israelites. Um, so it, it's an interesting picture of, of this man, Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, the time span, again, we can look at the date, 605 approximately to 536 BC. I like thinking of a time span as opposed to dates. And this book covers about 70 years which is a really important number if you're into prophecy and end times and some of these structures. Daniel himself is of royal birth. Uh, interestingly, the text tells us he's good-looking and showing intelligence in every wisdom. You can't say that today of a child in the school, can you? 
You're good looking and smart. You'd be fired, right? I mean, but this is the Bible, so it gets away with it. Uh, again, probably 16 when he's taken in captivity under Cyrus' range, 85 uh, at the end of his time. The text is, again, this so-called apocalyptic phrase. When you hear the word apocalyptic, you might think of apocalypse, like maybe a movie called Apocalypse Now. And, and those terms are typically used for this catastrophic, something that's going to happen that's real bad. It's apocalyptic. It's Armageddon. Well, the word really doesn't mean that. The word means a revelation, an unveiling, a disclosure so when you think of apocalyptic literature, you're talking about literature that's revealing things that we don't know. And so the prophetic nature of Daniel is the part we don't know. Some of the features of so-called apocalyptic literature include a person who receives God's word, in this case Daniel, symbolic language, which the book is full of crazy language, right? A future description, and oftentimes that includes God's people, and then poetic style. And I did not pull the slide together for this, but the chiasms in Daniel are rich for you Bible study nerds. They are amazing, the structure of these books. And this is one thing I would impress upon you as a Bible reader. Uh, never doubt that this book is not otherworldly. People could not write this stuff on their own. They simply could not. Now Shakespeare and uh, Chaucer and all these guys got nothing on the biblical authors. The, the, the structure, the language, the design of this stuff is otherworldly. And that, to me, just underscores inspiration is a reliable theology. Some of the poetic style, the dreams, the fiery furnace, Nebuchadnezzar, this hubris to madness, this humility then to recognize Yahweh, Daniel and the writing on the wall, the hand that comes out, all these things that some of our kids know perhaps better than we do. And then, of course, as uh, Grace pointed out, the Daniel and the lion's den, perhaps the most well-known, beloved story of the book of Daniel. Uh, his uh, captors don't have the same uh, uh, experience after Daniel is, is rescued from the lion's den. Of course, they are eaten upon arrival. Um, Daniel and portions of Ezekiel and portions of Zechariah and the book of Revelation, we could group those as apocalyptic literature. And I would just say for you, they deserve good study, not just cursory um, quite a sidebar, but some of us are old enough to remember the 70s when prophecy conferences were things people went to. Anybody go to a prophecy conference in your life? Uh, these things were huge, and they would go into uh, church, big churches, and all these people would come and spend all day Friday, Saturday, and part of Sunday talking about prophecy. Uh, hold a prophecy conference today, and nobody will come. Then the church did an interesting thing. It moved over to um, spiritual gifts analysis. And the signs and wonder movement was bubbling up in California. And all these churches were taking spiritual gift. We said, what's your gift? What's your gift? You know. And so we were taking inventories. What, what's your spiritual gifting? And so what we saw was an interest in the future become an interest in my gift. Not a bad thing necessarily. But the introspection to me led to uh, what we're seeing in more recent years. And I'm not against any of these tools. I just think it's it's interesting to watch our culture. So now we have the DISC, we have Myers-Briggs, Fire OB, MMPI, uh, Enneagram, of course, is the new Holy Grail. And so what, what are these things telling us at the bottom line about ourselves? Watch the shift from an interest of Bible study, prophecy conferences, biblical conferences that went on for weeks to I want to find out more about me. And I'm not against the church having an Enneagram, you know, seminar. But it just tells you a lot. If we were to hold a prophecy conference, or better yet, a prayer conference, no one would come, or very few. I don't say that to shame anybody. I say it as a cultural observation. The Western Christian mindset has become introspective. One of the, uh, if you know Larry Crabb's story, one of the interesting parts of his story was, his whole counseling empire, he folded it. He changed. He did a 180, and he said, introspection is not healthy. It's important to know a little about who you are, your history, and all that, but at some point you live forward, not looking in more and more who you are and your design, your wiring, how I'm gifted, my passions. My, and it's, just, it's a subtle, but I would say a significant change in the Christian Western mindset, and it is unique to the West. You won't see them doing Enneagrams in India or China. They're not concerned about that. 
So it's, it's just an observation. My theory is that um, prosperity and comfort have given us a platform that we don't worry about important things anymore. We worry about self. And it's just, an, it's just a reminder to all of us to keep you know, the Scripture in front of you, um, whether you're in the Bible study or whatever, uh, this is the Word of God. He did not stutter. It's living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword. Any person who can read or hear it can be exposed to it and grow. It's really not that difficult. And so all the pulls of, of culture and even in our local churches, which I'm not, I'm not mad at, I'm not bashing them, I'm just saying it's interesting. We can fill a room to talk about an Enneagram, but who cares about prophecy and end times? Not that you should, it's just an observation. Well, back from my side sidebar, um, the book of Daniel is unusual in another feature. It's written in two languages, Hebrew and Aramaic. Uh, Aramaic would have been the lingua franca of that day, as Greek was the lingua franca of Paul's day. So more people spoke Aramaic. Now, when you step back on it and say, why does God record, uh, and, and there's not much Aramaic in the Old Testament, but this is the bigger portion of it, why does he use that as a language to record the book of Daniel? Where are they? In captivity in Babylon. Babylonians don't speak the Jews' tongue Hebrew. This is in no small part about the Babylonians and Nebuchadnezzar and his kingdom and his reign. So if he wants to communicate to those people, he's going to write it in a language. It's just an observation. The languages aren't completely disparate, but a fluent person, a Babylonian person, more than likely would not know enough Hebrew to get around. But certainly Aramaic would be the lingua franca of the day. In this single book, uh, the message is accessible to the Gentiles. This is very important, especially when you think about prophetic literature. Um, Mark Water gives a, a very simple, and maybe not the best, but I like it, a, a suggestion of the theme of the book. When God's people had little hope, Daniel provided encouragement by revealing God's power and his plans for the future. It's a little simplistic, it's a little high, but I think it's a good reminder um, God's people had little hope. And again, we live on a timeline. We have a very poor view of history and a very poor view of our future. Uh, we're just a little dot on this eternal timeline. Faithful living is what he's concerned about, not some form of success that you and I might define. J. Dwight Pentecost offers five purposes for the book of Daniel, and I want to go through these briefly, but I have to tell you a Dr. Pentecost story uh, he was a professor at Dallas Seminary, and he was a bit of an irascible man and uh, had the typical, you know, gray, crazy professor hair with the glasses, brilliant man. Um, and he would come to class. It was called uh, uh, the General Epistle, Acts, Acts and General Epistles. And he would come to class. This was an English class. And he would have literally picked up a Bible off the shelf in his office. Not like my Bible with all my cheat notes in it. Just a Bible. And he would come to class, and he would, we had these big wooden podiums, and he would lean like this, and he would say, where do we leave off? And some student would, you had to be careful, I was the first person to ever say something in that class. I don't think I said anything the rest of the semester. Um, <laughs> but he, I said, he said, like, Acts chapter 4, and this is what he would do. I'm, I'm not exaggerating. He'd go, For about a minute, for about 60 seconds, which is an eternity, right? For about 60 seconds. And they go, all right, we're going to talk about 10 things. Boom, boom, boom. No computers, no tablets. You're taking notes on a pad with a pen. You couldn't write fast enough. That guy knew the scripture. He knew the word. And I go back when I study all these commentaries and different theologies and backgrounds. I'm listening to a series of lectures on the Christian history of, of the West and it's so striking how these tangents have emerged in our culture. And the one thing I'm so appreciative of my experience was they taught the Bible. Those things are important. Ologies, they're important. But Dr. Pentecost brought a Bible to class and scanned it, and then he knew what he was going to talk about, and it was gold. Five observations from Dr. Pentecost. Number one, Daniel 
Daniel's personal dedication to God would have been an example to the deportees on how they should live in a heathen society. Daniel served as an outstanding example to godliness to the exiles. Remember, he's a teenager now. He's been transplanted. He's going to spend most of his life in Babylon. And those around him are going to walk away very quickly from what they believed as Jews. They just are. There's no formal system in place, no worship center, the priesthood isn't in place, the offerings aren't happening, no Passover, no memorials, no remembrances. They've forgotten. If you're a child and you're no longer able to experience any of those things that are the fabric of your culture, they're taken away, what are you going to know? Very little. Here's a teenager who knew what he knew, and he is an example to those around him. Secondly, The book emphasizes God's sovereign authority over Gentile nations, over Gentile nations. And again, we go back to the Abrahamic covenant again and again and again. He, God made a decision before time to choose a people called the Jew and say, you're going to be a blessing to the world. That was God's decision before eternity. And now we're reading in this captivity phase, he's still sovereign over these Gentile nations, these Goyim. Uh, third, the book gives an example of God's faithfulness to his covenant people, even when they're under divine discipline. Um, when you have a wayward child in your home, most of us in this room who are parents have had one or two children break our hearts for a period of time. Might even just be a little middle school rebellion. Or you know, I, I saw someone on Instagram the other day, a young mother who was crushed said, the, the, the words I never thought my child said she hated me. Like, hey, get used to it, you know. Um, but, you know, when they're, when they're young and innocent, blah, 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 we're, we live in delusion for a while. Enjoy your delusion, right? Um, we still love them. When our children are very difficult and living in sin or have broken our hearts, we might be angry at them. We might be disappointed with their behavior. We might wish they would live differently, but you still love them. It doesn't stop. Um, and God, of course, is the perfect father still loves his children under divine discipline. Fourth, the the book is written to outline the prophetic period known as the time of the Gentiles. And this is perhaps, to me, one of the more remarkable parts of this book. This phrase, the time of the Gentiles, is, is, Luke talks about the time of the Gentiles. And when we construct these prophetic end of time themes, there's lots of variants I won't go into. But one of the things is, what does it mean, the time of the Gentiles? Again, if you were alive in the 70s, there was a huge messianic movement, and a lot of Jews were coming to know Christ. And out of that period, we had, uh, you know, the, these different chosen people ministries and different ministries, Ariel ministries came to the surface, and they were reaching uh, Jewish men and women in unprecedented numbers in the West. And many thought that the world's coming to an end because his people, where do they get this from? Romans 9, 10, 11. There's a, there's a partial turn of the Jew back, not to Judaism, but to Jesus as Messiah. And so there were a, a lot of excitement on end times, people going, this, the end's coming because the Jews are coming to Christ in, in large numbers. And uh, how you organize these schemes can be interesting, but there's a time of the Gentiles when the gospel is open to the Gentile population. And that's what I would call the church age or what we're living in now. And there's, again, variance doesn't matter that precisely. But the point is, Daniel is showing that God has his man, Daniel, in uh, in uh, Babylon affecting the Gentile people groups for good. He's using them to discipline his own people, but the message of Daniel's faithfulness and the message of God's word is going to impact Babylon for good. Five Uh, Daniel also reveals Israel's future deliverance and the blessing she will enjoy in the coming millennial age. I know some of you perhaps don't believe in a millennial. I do. I believe in a literal thousand-year millennial reign where Christ will return. And and so this book lends to that, the 70 weeks, uh, 70 years and seven weeks, all that is some pretty deep uh, theology that we won't touch obviously, in this high survey, but it does give a good picture of what this is going to look like in the millennial age. And before I look at four concluding lessons, I want to read a couple of passages. I'm actually going to have you read these with me, uh, because again, stepping back on the book, messianic uh, language is important to see at this period of time. A teenager in captivity in Babylon, and look at the clarity of the hope of Messiah. Why don't you read these with me? We'll start in Daniel chapter 2, verses 20 to 22. Daniel said, 
Let the name of God be blessed forever and ever, for wisdom and power belong to him. It is he who changes the times and the epochs. He removes kings and establishes kings. He gives wisdom to wise men and knowledge to men of understanding. It is he who reveals the profound and hidden things. He knows what was in the darkness, and the light dwells with him. Daniel is saying this, and you know the story perhaps well enough to know, when he interprets these dreams and visions, even though God calls him wise, God's given him this wisdom, and he attributes it to God, not him figuring it out. You can't do this apart from God, he's saying. Chapter 2, continuing verse 44. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. Stop for a second. Second Samuel chapter 7. This is the Davidic kingdom, the messianic throne. It's going to live forever. It is living forever, but we don't see it, quote unquote, while we're in captivity. What's happened? Israel's been destroyed. The temple complex in Jerusalem has been been decimated and pilfered. So, no, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. Keep with me then. And that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. And again, when you go to Israel, you'll see a Herodian temple complex that was built in Herod's time when Jesus was alive, the the, sort of the foundation walls, if you will, and how that will be reconfigured and rebuilt. We can have some pretty good, uh, you know, educated guesses. But at the end of that process, when the end times come, in the scheme that I particularly hold to, you may not, uh, Christ returns and a, a literal reign begins for a period of time. And somehow that's going to be reconfigured. And I, you know, if we're not here, we'll see it either way. But I can't wait to see what that will look like. And then Daniel 7, again, keeping in mind the throne, the messianic references to Christ being this person, this one is pretty hard to ignore. Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, read with me. I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came up to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, glory and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which will not pass away. His kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Messianic kingdom. So in many respects, this revelation of the Old Testament is talking about the kingdom, which of course the book of Revelation in our New Testament is the capstone that it is the reign of Messiah who comes at the end of time. Let's look at four lessons from the book of Daniel. Number one, the faithful life included blessings and trials. We don't like this theology. We wish we could live in such a way that we wouldn't go through difficulties and trials. Another cheery Michael Easley sermon. Uh, You're going to go through hard things, and you already know that. We just don't want to talk about it. And Daniel, of course, is a perfect example of a guy who lives in captivity. Have any of you been traveled to developing nations? So if you haven't, just think of camping out. You're going to leave behind hot and cold water, comfortable beds, heat, air conditioning. You're going to be in a situation where if you're fortunate, you have well water. If you're fortunate, really fortunate, there's a way to heat that well water to take a dipper bath. If you've not experienced a cold dipper bath, you ain't lived, right? And you're not going to do it every day. And women with your hair products, I'm sorry, just put it back because you don't have time or facility or electricity to do your hair over there. And uh, guys, you know, it's a lot easier for us. Bar of soap, we're happy. Uh, You're going to stink. You're going to eat some food that is probably not on your diet uh, list protocol. Forget about gluten and you know, all that nonsense. Uh, you're going to eat what's put before you. And you know, it's amazing that if you're there a few days, weeks, whatever, it's fine. Because everyone's living the same way. If you're taken from your home and you're put into another context, this is how Daniel was living. None of the appointments of being a Jew in Jerusalem did he have at his access. And so he's showing us not only how to faithfully live in that, 
He's showing us how he prospered in that environment. And our life, we, we, we encumber it with material acquisition is not bad. I'm not against. I mean, Cindy and I would be considered, you know, probably not one percenters, probably 0.05 percenters. And you are too, by the way, because you live in the West. China and India outweigh us every measurement possible. We think we're something. We're not. We're very prosperous here. We always want more. I'm not against that. I'm not anti that. I'm trying to tell you and remind me is we live in an unreal situation, perhaps more at ease than anyone on the planet. But you're still going to have trials. I think it's, you, know, you remember Maslow's hierarchy of needs? If you went to college, that was every class you had to talk about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And the first one was what? Food and shelter. If you don't have food and shelter, you can't ever get to self-actualization. If I'm hungry and I feel in danger, no place to sleep, I'm not worried about how I feel about myself today. I'm worried about eating and surviving. So he had this hierarchy of needs. When all that stuff stripped away, it's like Israel in the wilderness, water, manna, and God. And believe it or not, you can live that way. I don't want to live that way. No one chooses to live that way. But this life is going to be full of trials. As we go up the ladder of, uh, of you know, actualization and our needs are met, we don't worry about not having food. I mean, goodness, when the threat of snow comes and everybody jokes about bread and milk are gone. Do you really think you couldn't survive four days with what you got in your cupboard? Do you really think you couldn't survive with what's in your cupboard and in your refrigerator and your freezer for probably a month? Now, is it what you want to eat? No. But you could, you'd have it, right? We're crazy people. The threat of snow. And by the way, who eats all that bread and drinks all that milk anyway? I mean, how many of us sleep white bread, for goodness sakes? I don't know who they are, but apparently they come out when it snows. <laughs> As our needs are taken care of, me thinks emotional issues, personal issues, Self-actualization issues are now our problem. That's why we stare in social media. Everything else is taken care of. So we look into the mirror. It's not a real Christian life. It's just is the culture that we're in. We're frogs in the kettle. At some point, you've got to step back and say, okay, I'm going to have some good things and bad things. I think as our, as our comfort level goes up, the complexity of our problems goes up. When the props are taken away, you're not worried about what color palette you have for your home. You're not worried about redecorating the room. You're worried about, do I have enough matzah or enough corn or enough yam for a meal? It's just an interesting perspective to keep in mind. Secondly, Daniel's determination. And most of us, if you grew up in a church, you know, Daniel was determined. There's a lot of D uh, words with Daniel, be like, dare to be a Daniel, that kind of nonsense. Um, but where do we get it from? We get it from chapter 1, verse 8 and 9. But Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food or with the wine which he drank. He sought permission from the commander of the officials that he might not defile himself. And this is the important part. Now God granted Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the commander of the officials. Daniel determined, verse 8, Daniel made up his mind. So when I read this, and it's written in the margin of my Bible, MJE, what have you made up your mind about? And I'm not trying to put it as a legalistic bearing on anyone. Um, when I was uh, living in Chicago, I would sit on the Eisenhower for days because that's what you did. Just you know, traffic here is nothing compared to the Eisenhower. Or if you live in L.A., you know, you understand traffic. Um, and you sit there. And this is before we had Bluetooth and speaker technology. You had to, you know, put your speakerphone here and drive. And um, that was dangerous. But I remember sitting there, and I had a high SUV. And I could see things from my SUV that I didn't necessarily want to see or need to see. And sometimes you see some, let's just say, things you should never have seen. And I had this, I don't like the word mantra, but I had this saying, I would go, Michael, 
You can't look at that. You can't have that. You shouldn't see that. I mean, I'm going eight miles an hour. It's not like I'm in danger of having a wreck right at this point. So your mind, and to me, it's an analogy of living a faithful life. There's a lot of distractions on the, side, on the road to life. There's a lot of nonsense that pulls our hearts. What turns your head turns your heart. And if you're looking at something you shouldn't be looking at, looking at, God help us with technology, gentlemen. And I would just say, Michael, you can't have that. Michael, you can't look at that. And it wasn't like some legalistic beating myself up. It's just, Michael, you can't have that. In, in some weird way, it helped me. And I think that was the determination. What's your determination? What are you going to make up your mind? I'm, it's almost like rails on uh, guardrails on a highway. They're there in case you go too far. And don't think of this as legalism. Just go back to the text. Daniel made up his mind. Now, here's the caveat. Don't impose it on somebody else. That's legalism. And when people impose things on you and me, odds are they aren't living that way either. And that's why they're so upset about when somebody does something. You shouldn't do that as a Christian. Hmm, that tells me something about you. That's what it tells me about. The guardrails are there for a reason. And it's just it's self-discipline. It's time in the Word. All these things you know. But I asked the question to myself, and so I ask it to you. What have you made up your mind about? And then don't flinch. It shows up several times. Daniel chapter 6, verse 16, the king gave orders, and Daniel was brought in and cast into the lion's den. He spoke and said to Daniel, Your God, whom you constantly serve, will himself deliver you. Boy, that one's hard not to make the parallels of Christ, right? Um. Matthew 27, 19, Pilate's wife can't sleep. Don't leave the guy alone. Don't do this. And then, of course, we have the lion's den and the stone. Don't miss these things. They're too obvious, right? Christ is in a grave and a stone. He's dead. Not so much, right? Third, no one can thwart God's will. Now, this passage, pay attention because Nebuchadnezzar is the one speaking. This is Daniel chapter 4, verse 35. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, but he does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of earth. And no one can ward off his hand or say to him, what have you done? This is Nebuchadnezzar saying this, not Daniel. So this is the Babylonian king, more powerful than Rome at that time, who's saying, if it's up to God, you can't stop it. You can't thwart it. I've shared with you many times before, perhaps not in this context, but in others. Um, Cindy and I were doing a um, like a financial peace university and a uh, crown study with a group of people back in Virginia, and we would share things we had learned. And this one guy, uh, after one of the studies came, and he was so eager to share, he said, no one can thwart God's will for my life. And we probably spent about 20 minutes in the group in the rabbit trail about, is that statement true? Now, if I put a blindfold around my head and wander around 65, you know, uh, at uh, 5 o'clock in the afternoon, things may not go well for me, but that's self-inflicted stupidity. But if I'm showing up and doing what I'm supposed to do and living faithfully, can anyone thwart God's will for my life? That shows your view of God and whether or not he's sovereign. Here's King Nebuchadnezzar saying of Daniel's God, no one can ward off his hand. To me, this is very liberating. Because of the trials, thick and thin of life, we yet live faithfully knowing nobody can stop God. And again, in this long view of Christianity, we may or may not see the things we want to experience in our Christian life, nor our children or grandchildren, but God's History, his story, is not going to be altered by any human or any human event. And to me, that's encouraging, whether it's Islam or terrorism or the economy or health or the the coronavirus, for goodness sakes. I mean, what is it now, 25 million people have been quarantined in China? Uh, uh, Sorry if you work for the World Health Department. I always laugh when they go, it's really not that big a threat. I go, yeah, it will be tomorrow. It's like they just rope-a-dope you. It's crazy. Well... 
no one can thwart God's will. Period. That's liberating to me. It might be terrifying to you. Finally, prayer. And again, this is, this is sort of juxtaposed with prophecy. People don't care much about prophecy. They really don't care much about prayer. When we started Stonebridge, Wayne and I had this one mutual conviction. We have to learn to pray more in line with Scripture than experience. We have to. I was reading through Daniel again and again this week, and Daniel 9 just blew me away. This prayer is worth your devotions this week. In the first year of Darius, the son of Asherah, the Median, the descendant who was made king over the kingdom of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, observed in the books the number of years which was revealed as the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet. Interestingly, he has the word of Jeremiah at his disposal. Verse 3, so I gave my attention to the Lord God to seek him by prayer and supplication with fastings and sackcloth and ashes. That's underlined two times in my Bible, all those words. Prayer, supplications, fasting, sackcloth and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and I confessed and said, Alas, O Lord, who keeps his covenant and loving kindness, that's the word chesed we talk about, for those who love him and keep his commandments. This Prayer is worth your study. And when we come back to the basic line, God's Word, God's Spirit, and God's people are what's going to help us to be more like Christ. I know it can seem hard. I'm not trying, I'm not, I'll never ask you if you pray or how long you pray. I would never do that to anyone, but I'm asking you at a distance do you pray? And might we be a little more like Daniel, not him as a hero, but a man of faithfulness, a man of tenacity, a man who made up his mind? Michael Leasley in Context is fully funded by our listeners. Would you consider giving a one-time or perhaps monthly donation to support our ministry? You can give at michaelincontext.com. In Context is produced by Hannah Seymour and music composed by Chad Cates.